Mark, we'll let you, uh, you know, take it away. Thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yep. Can. Great. Let me introduce our panel and myself. I'm Mark Silva. I'm CEO and founder of Kite. In the previous uh, session, we had a wide range of topics on digital transformation. As Josh mentioned, we're going to telescope into open innovation specifically. Uh, who are, who's Kite? We're a leading startup relationship management platform. Uh, we're becoming the virtual startup scouting solution for a lot of enterprise and enabling remote collaboration across the enterprise with our uh, SRM platform. Uh, Bidad had some amazing insights. I don't know about you guys, but my brains were on fi was on fire. I felt like he almost kind of teed up some of the things uh, we want to be talking about. <clears throat> uh, one of uh, the things was talking about uh, rethinking people models, operating models, go-to-market models, et cetera. Uh, but one of the things he mentioned was partnerships. And he said, how are you placing your bets? And first, if you're going to be placing bets, you have to be show up at the table. And our panelists basically have showed up at the table. They've been putting their enterprises in a position to be able to place bets on open innovation. Um, and so each of our panelists have unique perspectives from media, entertainment, and ISP and media, um, a, a leading financial and F and CG company. So we have Comcast, Alliance Bernstein, and Clorox in the house. And each of them have radically different programs uh, around open innovation. I think this is going to be really interesting because of that. So how do you bring the outside in your uh, organization? How have each of these companies um, been able to do so? And more importantly, these leaders uh, would love to have you introduce yourselves, uh, your role, and uh, where you report in the org, as well as some of the programs, and then we'll do a little bit more of an impact, starting with you, Danielle. Hi, thank you, Mark. I uh, hope everybody is well out there. I'm Danielle Khan. I'm the VP of Startup Engagement and the head of Lift Labs for Comcast NBC Universal, based in Philadelphia. Our team fits within the strategic development team within our company, and uh, that's run by our chief business development officer, Sam Schwartz. Um, our team works across the entire enterprise, be it Comcast, NBC, Universal, Universal Pictures and Parks. And basically we are responsible for um, really building meaningful relationships with startups, mostly pre-seed through Series B. And we do that through relevant content. We have three core programs that I can talk about. Um, and really our goal is around driving business outcomes and driving value to both startups as well as to our enterprise. Um, we do everything from startup research, scouting with partners like Kite. Uh, we run three accelerators, one with Techstars, two with Boomtown, uh, and we run programs ourselves, proofs of concept programs, and also have a pretty robust community online uh, that relies on, on our media platform as well. So good to meet everybody. Thanks, Danielle. You know, uh, Bidad was actually challenging us to rethink these things. I actually think we should have a virtual background that almost looks like a baseball card with your stats there. And so <laughs> it'll literally have like the first, uh, the first activities uh, already taken care of. Uh, in the meantime, before we, we take that challenge on, Coley, next. Hi, I'm Coley Corte. I am the head of business transformation globally at Alliance Bernstein. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're about a $550 billion asset manager. We manage institutional assets as well as retail assets um, across asset classes. So um, fixed income, equity, and some alternatives as well. Uh, my role in the organization is really helping us look at the modernization of our distribution function. So I report to the head of our client group, which is about 80% of our business. Um, and we're looking at how we use digital to really scale that business. Um, and in today's world, also to create those meaningful connections that were happening face to face. Um, so our, you know, we've been tilting our focus to both support today's world even more. Um, we're using data to create personal and relevant interactions across channels um, and to enable us to know where to put the resources and in what channels. And then we're really looking at increasingly efficiency and effectiveness, both making it easier for our, our employees to do their jobs and our customers to work with us. <clears throat> we have two tracks we tend to look at, um, evolution, 
uh, which is extending today's supply chain. Obviously that supply chain is, is shifting rapidly. So we also have like a revolution path where we're looking at disrupting uh, that supply chain and coming up with new and innovative solutions, expanding into adjacencies and other areas. Um, I would say that uh, since mid-March, our focus has been more on the evolution side and supporting the existing business, but we're continuing to move both paths forward because we think they're, they're both incredibly important um, to our business globally. Great, thank you, Naveen. Hi, um, welcome. I'm Naveen Kunde, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Kunde. Um, uh, thanks for having me. I'm just always thrilled to be part of this, uh, this group. So um, I lead the open innovation uh, group at Clorox. And um, I've been with Clorox for about 10 years. I was a consultant before then. Uh, decided to um, actually go back into the real world and be useful. Um, so uh, what I do is we have a small team that sits across all the different Clorox businesses uh, from the legacy Clorox uh, business that has wipes and bleach, et cetera, to the foods business with Hidden Valley Ranch and other brands to Burt's Bees and some of our natural personal care, Brita, Kingsford Charcoal. We even have a cat litter business. So we have uh, folks who wear the open innovation hat who sit within each of those businesses and they, they report to me. Um, and what we do is we bring uh, external perspective and capability to each of these businesses with the intention of enabling better decisions. And the key is not just to throw a bunch of external stuff at them to distract them. The key is to distinguish where you need it and where you don't to really understand the problems you're trying to solve and the gaps that these businesses have. Some of it is business model innovation, gaps, some of that might be technology scouting related gaps. It could be any of the above. So we have a very versatile team um, that really understands the business, but also keeps one foot in what's happening outside. And then we connect the dots. Uh, so that's, that's what we do uh, at Clorox. Thank you. Uh, and, and um, Coley, going to you, you were talking a little bit about, uh, I remember you were on a South by Southwest panel uh, about a year and a half ago, you're just getting started. Uh, you were just a kid with a dream, and you you were uh, saying, you know, our objective is to drive 25% digital uh, uh, revenue. Uh, so you're you're looking at transforming that much of the business, um, and at the time that probably seemed like a big, hairy, audacious goal, and now it seems like essential that we 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 find ways of doing that. Uh, talk a little bit about your evolution, revolution, and and your journey so far. Yeah, and actually something I took away from both what Danielle and Naveen said, which I probably didn't touch on, is that I always say that the um, what we do is, um, and they both said this articulated it much better than me, we have a laser-like focus on driving business results, right? So we're not doing this because it's fun and, oh, we're doing cool things with startups and with uh, digital and we're trying this out. It's all about driving a business outcome. So I think to Naveen's point, it's understanding a problem and then uh, you know, coming up with a series of solutions and having measurable impact. Um, I want to add a little distinction, Mark, to what you said is our goal is really to drive diversification. So we want to drive growth and diversification in our revenue stream. It's not necessarily digital revenue, um, but it is revenue from new channels, uh, could be new businesses, um, but but different than the, the core business, which uh, that's where the evolution is, right? So evolution is enabling that business to persist on, um, and revolution is helping us target um, new customers, new channels, um, and new services and products. Uh, you know, so I, um, it's been about a two and a half year journey, right? So to me, year one was uh, defining the vision and the mandate um, and, getting the buy-in, aligning the operating model, building out the team. You know, I think similar to Naveen, the team is fairly small, right? Um, because we're not trying to build duplicates of things. We're trying to work with the businesses um, and also work with external partners to, to drive those things forward. Um, and then your last year was really about experimentation and figuring out the areas of focus. And this year has been really with that laser-like focus on results. Um, you know, the 25%, you're right, it's, it's, a, it's a big number. But I think it's totally doable. And I do think, as you said, it's required in today's environment that, you know, rapidly, the ways we were doing business have been cut off, right? So quickly, we've, you know, and, and some of these things aren't innovations per se, but they are things that are new to our business. So in some ways, they are 
innovative for us. So um, we had been planning a stage rollout of a social selling program. Again, lots of people use social channels. We're a highly regulated business, fairly conservative in how we reach customers with a fairly you know, established customer base. Um, and uh, while we were planning the stage rollout with the teams who were a little more eager for prospecting, um, when uh, the events in March with COVID-19 came around, uh, we accelerated that and we rolled out social to um, within the US to everyone and we're looking at the global use cases and the channels for that. Um, so, you know, I think that in many ways the team is in more demand and accelerating in some, some areas of impact while other areas, you know, just given our size and scale and, and where we're focusing, we'll, we'll slow down a little bit. That's great. And I, I think that, that accelerating some areas, slowing down in other areas, uh, it's, it's the essential question of strategy. What are we going to keep doing? What are we going to stop doing? What are we going to do next? Uh, Danielle, you've had that a little bit with, uh, obviously, you've got a physical presence, one of the most beautiful uh, labs you walk into, this, this almost like um, temple to innovation in, uh, in Philadelphia that was just built and now you're uh, shifting to remote with some of these programs and activities. Talk a little bit about what's happening and maybe share a little bit more background on like the accelerator, et cetera. Yeah, so um, our team is, is also small. We have six team members. Um, we started about five years ago. Uh, the first couple of years we spent doing a listening tour. We actually went and met with uh, 1,500 entrepreneurs across the US and in London and Tel Aviv. And we sat and asked them, what did they want from a corporate innovation program? Um, what would be a good partnership? And every part of Lyft Labs was created with all of their insights. So um, if, they tell, if they told us that someone else had done it in a way that they thought was really valuable, we leaned in that way. And if they said that something wasn't so great, we leaned away from that. Um, so we've taken a, a very grassroots effort um, and mindset in building our programs. The three main programs we run, one, we, we, we do run a space. So in the, in the beautiful Comcast Technology Center, um, which is in downtown Philadelphia, um, we have an entire floor dedicated to Lift Labs. Um, there is a space also in Atlanta at our Atlanta headquarters called The Farm. So we have spaces that we were operating until you know, the buildings uh, were no longer being used as office spaces temporarily. Um, and fortunately for us, we didn't have an accelerator running at the time. We were actually in between programs. So, um, but what we do there is we basically run workshops, author talks, and they're in, it's a mixture of employees from our technology products team who come together with the community of startups and technologists from not just Philadelphia, but people come from all over the world. And then we publish and, and promote all of this content for free on our media platform that we created. We have now moved all of that virtually. And we did that pretty seamlessly. I was really proud of our, our team because uh, we didn't miss a day of programming. We just picked up because we're so used to working as digital nomads, <laughs> our team. Um, so now we're just playing with all the tools that are available for um, talks, which are easier than collaboration tools, which are a little harder. And um, the second component of what we do is we do run, you know, accelerators in partnership with Techstars in Philly and Boomtown in, in Atlanta. And so the program in Atlanta actually went totally virtual. Um, that's an early stage agnostic uh, program. In Philadelphia, we decided to delay our program that was supposed to start in uh, the summer. We've delayed that to September, and we're keeping an eye on the on the, that. You know, will that take place in person? Will it be virtual? Um, and either way, we want to make sure that we are providing the greatest value to founders as as we can. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about our focus areas. And then the third program actually came. Um, after a couple of years of running accelerators and doing this on our own, what we realized we were, our team was really good at was getting proofs of concept and pilots done that led to investment for these companies in the end, whether that was from us or from others. And so our third program really leans in on what Mark would call open innovation. We, uh, I think, call it more around like proof of concept pilot, and we've developed an entire process for running that. And uh, we just kicked off one in the accessibility space. We basically pulled together 
leaders from across the entire enterprise, whether they work in accessibility or inclusive design or any part of, um, and really, I mean, inclusive design is really about all of us. And we're developing what's our call for startups going to be outside of an accelerator. And that will focus on later stage, I would say, like A, B round enterprise ready companies. And we'll be guiding them through process and picking a couple that we want to run projects with. And, uh, and we're excited to be doing that. And, and uh, a lot of teams have already proactively reached out to us to say that they would like our help in shepherding um, their own projects and their own um, priorities in, in this way. Um, our focus areas, and then I'll stop. Um, our main focus areas, which was interesting this year, were in very relevant areas. So when we were asked to, do you need to shift anything? We certainly added some things to our focus areas that got a little more detailed, but our focus areas, ironically, or we were just like watching what was happening in the rest of the world, it was future of work, so everything about remote work. Our second was about interactive and immersive experiences, both at home and in places like theme parks and movie theaters. So it's, you know, that was very timely. The third one is really around expanded and advanced connectivity, which you know, hopefully all of our internet and everything is working and we're staying sane um, at home with, with our loved ones because that's working. And the fourth one was really around personalization. And if you think about it from either a digital marketing perspective or how you wanna, you know, your family wants to connect with one another, you can see how each one of them were ironically, um, you know, worked out in the end. The only thing that we didn't predict was that we should have bought more Clorox wipes every single time they were in the store and I saw the three pack. I don't know what I was thinking because I just ran out today. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, we're going to talk to the, uh, the king of Clorox wipes. Uh, he's sitting on his empire of, of Clorox uh, wipes there. Um, just kidding, actually, um, Naveen, uh, we actually asked if we could have every participant who raises their hand right now get some, and he said no. Um, anyway, uh, Naveen, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, interesting uh, that a little bit of prescience allowed the focus areas to be uh, relevant today, and a little bit of fine tuning allows them to continue to be uh, relevant. Uh, you guys actually prepared for this kind of a scenario. Uh, for your supply chain and for your ways of working, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Um, first of all, uh, thank you uh, for a plug for Clorox. Um, but uh, Comcast is keeping my life alive right now because we have you know Comcast in our house and we have these little pods everywhere and everybody's working and the kids Naveen, are connected. Is it, interrupt yeah. you. Is, it, is it crazy that my kid is probably streaming some sort of multiplayer game right now? Someone's on a an uh, educational school uh, uh, curriculum, and um, I think there's a yoga workout going on. Yeah, so, I love it. I absolutely love it. And uh, thank you. you know, and, and yeah. So, yeah, thank yeah. thank you. And and I think um, going back to um, uh, you know Clorox. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't get uh, wipes for everyone. Even I can't get wipes. You can. We'll have to buy them like everybody else. You know, in the stores. And we made a very uh, principled decision to get. Um, the wipes production to, to the max point we, we can uh, and, and for other products uh, where uh, we are not compromising on quality or you know safety because you, not, you don't want to cram a bunch of workers into the plant. You have to kind of be careful there um, and, and prioritizing uh, the healthcare facilities and others to get those products first. So we, we, have, we have a plan in place. And uh, some elements of this plan, we actually uh, sort of mocked up a few years ago um, using, um, you know, a, we, we had a session thinking about the future of cleaning, future of healthcare. And one of the uh, main parts of that was pandemic prep. Uh, as you look at the future, you look at all the scenarios that can are probable and impactful. A pandemic was very high on that high probability, high impact point compared to an asteroid, which was high impact, literally, uh, but not high probability or nuclear war or something else, or uh, something else that was maybe low impact, but high probability. Uh, and so we had to think through the um, implications for supply chains. So for example, we looked at where all the shipping containers would be all over the world, where our supply chains were, where our vulnerabilities were, 
and we updated our uh, uh, playbook for uh, you know emergency preparation um, with this pandemic view that was about three years ago. Um, it allowed people to tip the point on, you know, they were thinking about in-housing wipes production, for example. This was an additional data point that got in there because then we saw that we were vulnerable to all our suppliers. So in-housing wipes production was, was a key there uh, and so on. So um, I, I, I'm very proud of that because uh, our team, the open innovation team was very much involved along with the folks in the cleaning and professional healthcare businesses to put that um, futures workshop together, but also run the top leadership so that they would be influenced by whatever was being done. Uh, we're talking business unit leadership, chief operating officer type leadership. And uh, I, I strongly feel that as innovators, it's very important for us to be able to have these ideas and concepts, but install them into the business where they actually make an impact, where they have an influence. Otherwise, it's just a, a bunch of great thoughts, et cetera, in isolation, and it's not actually changing the mothership in any meaningful manner. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I, I just want to emphasize that aspect of it. So whether you do a pandemic prep or whatever it might be for your business, make sure that you have the right stakeholders on board and doing something with whatever has to come up with. Naveen, if we all acted on information, we'd all have uh, flatter tummies and uh, you know be that much more healthy. Uh, that's not going to happen necessarily. But uh, when's the right time to do this kind of pandemic? And what, tell me a little bit more about. It's almost like scenario planning when you talked about size, impact, and timing of those kind of things. Um, I'm just reading the Black Swan again. In fact, listening to it uh, by Talib, by Nassim Taleb, and it's it's almost like he was predicting this whole situation uh, uh, a decade ago when he came up with that. Um, it, we, we as humans aren't necessarily very good and therefore the innovation groups could be the superhuman part of us that plans for the unplanned. I mean, that's kind of what we do really well. What's around the corner? What's the unenvisioned? So how, when's a good time to do it? How did you actually do it? Yeah, I'll tell you what's a bad time to do it is after the pandemic hits. Yeah, yeah. Um, everybody puts just, yeah. you know, everybody puts so, um, in the day after they get robbed. Yeah, so I think, I think we, we need to um, not think about it as pandemic prep, but think about it as futures prep. Yep. Um, and pandemic, it was just one of the elements that was considered along with a lot of other things that were looked at from consumer behavior change, intersection of that with technology involvement, com competitive activity, startup activity. So you have to look at it holistically, right? And then you have to say, okay, what are the things that might come down the pike that might impact us and are we prepared for it? Are we underprepared for it? That's, that, that's basically it. But more importantly, and I make it sound simple, but you have to do it systematically and consistently. And more importantly, you need to have the stakeholders on board and not do it in a vacuum. Um, and, you know, so I, that I imagine, can make a difference. I, I imagine now that we're all coming out of this almost Maslow hierarchy of needs where we were hunkering down and trying to figure out what's going on. Now that we're starting to get back to a little bit of a new normal. Uh, I, I imagine there's a real openness to saying, what are the other areas that we should be thinking about so we don't get a double hit or whatever? It seems like there's an opportunity to eventually start pursuing some of this. Um, they say that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And Danielle, I noticed that almost within days, some guy, I'm pretty sure, really super senior executive in Hollywood who's been banging the drum on digitization and closing the windows and stuff like that, rolled out Trolls within seconds. It's almost like did not waste a minute and within three days, suddenly we hear that Trolls is gonna go from a theatrical release to, and you're saying thank you because that's another way you're, you're saving us. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have any background on that, Danielle? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that had been considered for a while and um, you know, it, it was a forcing function. And uh, I think it, it definitely was a, a good sign <laughs> that people wanted to, to see it there. I mean, I, we also definitely want live events and theaters and theme parks to reopen, um, to make no mistake about that. Um, you know, but it, I, Comcast and BCU is very forward thinking and there's always scenario planning going on and we're lucky to have um, you know, really smart people who are thinking about that um, all the time. Um, but it's definitely, you know, I think 
showing a trend. It'll be interesting to see what happens when places are reopen and you know what what do people want to do again. Um, I think the thread that I'm weaving through this is is yep. things that had traditional barriers to implementing, and a lot of naysayers, even business units that before wouldn't have approached you about saying, hey, you guys figured out how to work with startups. How do we accelerate our activity? Are coming out of the woodwork saying, as hand raisers, there's a real openness now, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, we have always had a, a company that's very open to innovation. Um, our founder, Ralph Roberts, um, you know, who created Comcast, has been such an entrepreneur um, for, for his entire life. And his son, Brian, is the same mindset. So we have a company that's always looking around the corner and always trying new things. It is an interesting time though in media in general. Um, you know, if you think about some of the shows that have now gone online and uh, Fallon is just picking it up in his house and you, you're in his tree house. And I love what um, the some good news is that John Krasinski is doing. Like people are being really interesting and innovative in content. I'm actually really excited to see how that really ends up transforming that, you know, and for all of us, you know, we can do our job from just about anywhere we want to do it, you know, with many exceptions to that rule. But um, certainly you can pop up a studio in your house <laughs> and you can see a little bit into the lives of the people that you are, are really interested in knowing a little bit more about their personal life in a way. Chloe, talk a little bit about that, about, about that. I think of, you know, again, a $55 billion financial institution as, um, you know, very traditional uh, company having to move into a non-traditional uh, remote space. I think you guys were in transition anyway from New York. Uh, so talk a little bit about how that's, that uh, the kind of double change is happening uh, for you and how, how, how do you fit into that? Sure, and I, I just want to step back to one thing that I had wanted to get in before when um, uh, Naveen was talking. I think that looking that future proofing and those future scenarios um, are the reason that the levers and the sort of the focal areas we had, similar to what Danielle said, haven't changed. Maybe the application within them, right? So the three pillars we had going into this year were, um, you know, more omni-channel engagement with customers, right? So creating digital pathways was really, really critical. Of course, that's accelerated. Um, knowing our customers better, capturing and storing and leveraging that data, which is critical. Those two things fit together really well, but um, we've been building a, a data um, 360 view of our customers and a data ecosystem around that. And then the third one was efficiency and effectiveness, which obviously in this scenario, right, any opportunity to be operate more effectively is critical. And some of the work we're doing with you, Mark, around um, how we can automate some parts of our processes, I think, um, is, is an example of something that was already in flight, but is even more in demand. I think the other thing that we've seen is um, we were very fortunate in how our infrastructure, um, which has nothing to do with me, was built. Um, so even when we we're in the workplace, we were working on um, technology that was almost as if we were working remotely. So it was a remote desktop. So as we transitioned to people working remotely, that was really seamless. We were using Zoom. Um, but one of the things that we've seen as a incidental benefit, I think, is tighter partnerships globally. So we were a um, New York headquartered company. We've been moving our headquarters to Nashville over the past two years, um, with this year being the third year in that journey and, and building our, our new site. Um, and you know, one of the concerns from a culture standpoint was that we took a New York centric culture, which is always a challenge in a global organization and made it a Nashville centric where people would be like, well, if you're not in Nashville, oh, I can't grab this person. I run into that person. Well, now that everyone's dispersed, right? This using Zoom first um, has actually sort of leveled the playing field to be agnostic to where you're located. And in many ways, I think it's made it easier for our teams to work globally um, and sort of remove any sort of barrier to location, you know, specific. Uh, so that's, that's been exciting to see. I think the other thing is, as you guys were talking about video production, and uh, yeah. I use this analogy a lot, right? So if um, Ellen or, uh, you know, the Good Morning America host can 
record from their homes. I'm pretty sure our portfolio managers can record short videos and produce them and no one's expecting them. And maybe that personal element of seeing where they are, seeing my Peloton behind me, you know, actually adds something to that relationship and to that dialogue and a candidness. Um, and so our speed at getting stuff to market um, is actually can improve. And that's something I think should persist, you know, regardless of the environment we're in. I like you um, mentioning, mentioning the positive side of, I don't know about anybody else, but I feel like this fabric of our life is starting to become so enmeshed that I'm finding that there is no off. And uh, just personally, that there's a, there's a new normal of, uh, of uh, meetings that start early, in late, and everything else. And I think that putting these things in, um, in uh, some form of containers are, have, a, have a healthiness to it as well. But I think there's a challenge right now for, I mean, those of us who are working parents, right? Um, you know, a dual income family with kids in school, um, trying, you know, it's always been hard to manage a work-life balance. I'm not sure there's ever been a balance. It's just that you have work and life and together. Um, but that's even more present now, right? And managing and leading teams through that, um, you know, it's, it's, incredibly hard and you have to be just incredibly sensitive to where people are personally um, and and how they can work right effectively so some of my team can work most effectively at night after their kids go to bed and that's totally fine right um, because it's unrealistic to expect people uh, as someone on my team with a two and a four year old she can't possibly you know and she and her husband both work they po can't possibly be completely productive during the day and tend to the children who actually at that age really need a fair amount of, of supervision Right. So. Yeah, I think this is going to really uh, test leadership um, because there's a people element of this that you can't just wish away. Uh, yeah, digital is great. Those of us who have been pushing digital tools, etc., it'll be great. But I think there will become a point where the the human need for connectivity and trust building will need to be reestablished somehow, whether it's in digital channels or slowly coming back to the human centric world, which is why co-locating does make sense. We can access digital talent anywhere, but you get the best out of those people when you already have a base of trust. Uh, in my previous company, I was in DC. I had a lot of great, great relationships for me moving to the Bay Area. I was able to maintain those relationships. So that was, that was seamless. But when somebody brand new is joining the team, and now if you think about future workforce, and they're all gonna be joining digitally, virtually, I don't even have a personal connection. How's that going to work? Uh, how are those coffee shop, water cooler conversations that are so key in innovation? And I, I, I distinguish between innovation versus more of an executional role uh, if you're in finance or uh, you know, accounting or something where you can be equally productive at your desk or work at 3 a.m. Whereas in innovation, it's that collision of those different ideas that you know, connect with each other. Right now, I mean, I'm having a great time having a chat, but I miss the people in the audience at previous CDX conferences where I'm interacting, but I'm seeing somebody give me eye contact and nod, right? Right now, I'm obviously, Coley is nodding at Daniel, and I appreciate that, but it's like the rest of them, and then I have those little hallway conversations during a break as I'm desperately trying to go to the bathroom or whatever it might be, but that's valuable. And I'm, I think at some point, we're gonna, we're gonna hit a plateau in the innovation and that's one of the things I worry about. Yeah, working in the, I worked in the travel industry for 20 years, um, very worried about that, you know, but that, you know, I remember back in the day, people were like, oh, there's just gonna go to virtual meetings, but the technology didn't exist to really do real virtual meetings all the time. Um, now that people at all levels are getting used to doing virtual meetings, it'll be interesting to see how does it take longer to get back to business as usual on meetings, traveling for meetings? That's definitely something that I'm sure the US Travel Association is thinking about and all the destination management companies. Um, I think there's a certain amount of this that is, is, is fine being done this way, but I think to Naveen's point, right, the incidental, and this is true in the office or in a meeting, the incidental contact doesn't really happen. I mean, we've tried to set up some things, right? We have an open, um, chat line amongst my team and people have virtual coffees. But like normally in the office, there's a certain amount of productivity when I just get up from my desk and I'm walking to the restroom and I run into someone and we have, a, that's actually a really productive conversation that I can't plan for. Yeah. Um, and so those are the things that in addition to missing like sort of the human contact is missing those sort of 
those sparks and finding a way to replicate those. And I know many of us have given some idea and thought behind it. Some of that just doesn't happen, right? And there's also, uh, to me, I think I'm missing a productivity element, which is if I'm on this call, I, and I know none of us can multitask, but I can't do anything else. But normally I have a little gap when I'm in the office and I can do something in between those meetings. And now I'm literally like, you know, just connecting to the next meeting. And I have to so like keep a notebook now with all the things I need to do that I might have fit in in between. So to your point around how long the days last, right? Um, at the end of the day, I also have now this paper list of things I need to go do online that I haven't been able to do because I've been on you know video all day. Yeah. And with interesting that. running a space is we run a space. So we constantly have people asking us questions. So I'm finding I actually have time to like write up notes in between things because I don't have someone just popping in and being like, hey, do you have a second? Because I love serendipity like everyone else. But, uh, you know, and that is the one piece is people, right, you run into someone randomly in, in the lobby of your building and you're with a startup and you see this person and you say, oh my gosh, you're the person I wanted to connect you to. I want you to, to meet and you don't have that random serendipity that is magic in, in innovation. Yeah, I, I think this is a crisis of corporate innovation. I know for startups, a lot of times they are doing that. I mean, we're using Slack Reason. We actually do virtual happy hours. We do all those kind of things as a way of trying to maintain culture. I think we have Josh, did you want to jump in and um, you had some questions coming in from the audience? Yeah, we had a, a bunch of questions. I'm going to quickly go to uh, Art Schickman from Elephant Ventures. Uh, Art, you should be able to speak now. Hey, thanks, Josh. Uh, I had a question for the panel. It feels like there's a bunch of uh, innovation product development folks with tons of staff that are suddenly idle. And um, I think the, the commercial willingness of those folks to put some skin in the game and approach corporate innovation programs is, is massively different than it used to be. And I wondered if you guys had some opinions on like, where, where are you thinking out of the box or where might you be receptive to kind of non-traditional commercial arrangements in your open innovation agenda? Great question. Anybody want to feel that? Yeah, I can, I can take that. Um, we, have, we are actually busier than ever. Uh, there's a lot of uh, shorter term things that we're working on um, that have been accelerated, but then we are not letting go of any of the longer term programs. So uh, we would definitely be looking for external partnerships or working with uh, folks outside in the areas we care about um, to keep some of those longer term programs going because all our internal staff is just packed with some of the shorter term stuff. So, you know, if we always used to complain that everybody is quarter by quarter focused. Now everybody is like thinking about only the next week. So, um, uh, so I don't complain about the old days anymore. They're the good old days. Uh, and, and so uh, I think th there's definitely some room for partnership on some of the longer term stuff. I would echo that. I mean, I think, um, as I mentioned, we're tilting our focus to, to helping with the immediate situation and building more of the foundational stuff than we might have focused on, you know, in a, in a more normal time. Um, and it, but as a result, we don't want to give up on some of the bigger dreams as we, as the markets resume a sense of normalcy, um, even if it's the new normal. So we don't want those things to fall behind. Um, and so if there are partners that can help us there, or like things we're working with Kite on, um, accelerants to some of the automation efficiency and effectiveness that enable teams to focus on higher order tasks, that's all also, you know, if they can focus on higher value add, um, that helps us as well. So we're always looking for partners that can help us drive value either in the longer term or short term initiatives. And the only thing I would add to that is we're definitely seeing later stage startups um, that are applying to our programs and specifically the liftoff program that we run, which is the POC. We don't, we're not looking for like ideas. We're looking for scalable enterprise ready solutions. So I think um, now's the time when a lot of people who have something that they think is ready to scale, um, you know, I, I think uh, there isn't one answer anymore. Uh, I think companies aren't looking for like one, one response to something, but are willing to try different um, solutions at the same time and do some A-B testing. Yeah. Also, let me, let me add, um, this is an incredibly good time to connect with some of uh, the companies 
that are open to working with the outside because there has never been as much focus as I have, you know, in my career. Like this, the, people are just focused. All the random stuff has just fallen off. And they are incredibly focused both on the stuff that they need to do in the short term, as well as the stuff that they need to do in the medium and long term. And, and to Kohli's point, people are just a stretch super thin. So they are open to partnering. Uh, for us specifically, it's more the longer term stuff. But uh, I, I can imagine that even for the shorter term stuff, people know what they want. There's been a clarity that's come from uh, this crisis. Yeah, I would add to that clarity to say, and I know, Mark, you brought up earlier strategy, right? And strategy is always as much what you're going to do as what you're not going to do. And that's always hard for people. But I think now that's come much more into focus, right? Um, and um, we've always talked about the opportunity to partner is outside of our core capabilities and that we want to be protective of our core capabilities and enable people to focus more in those areas. And I think we have much more clarity as an organization broadly, as opposed to just my team on what that means. And so I think in many ways, it's easier to partner with us because we just are, are really sure of our focus areas and um, what we bring to the table and what a partner can do. And the last thing I would just add on that, sorry, um, uh -huh. it's a great question, by the way, um, yes. is, you know, th this is also not the time to just cold call on people. I think if you have an existing relationship with an organization and you have something very relevant, that this is the time that you think it could really solve a problem. Um, I don't think this is the time to start cold calling people that you don't know. It's just, um, it's tone deaf. You're not going to get a response. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so we've um, we've actually come to the end of our time. So I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists. I'd like to thank Josh and Drew with Techonomy and CDX, BCG, and all of you attending for making this possible. It's nice to have an excuse to dress up, and it's nice to have a an excuse to spend some time with some really bright people. Thank you. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Hi. I I didn't I didn't dress up. I'm gonna go for a workout after this, so I'm already in my workout clothes. Don't do so. it, man. Obsess That's... over that. Go. All right. All right. Ciao. Bye. Thank, thanks, Mark. Thank thanks, Naveen. Thanks, Coley. Thanks, Danielle. Um, thanks, everyone, for for joining us for that uh, that session. Um, thanks for having us. Great.